<laughs> We're on the air. <laughs> Don't tell this guy that. <laughs> okay, welcome back. Um, can somebody please shut that door so we can... You can hear. Yeah, on the way out, yeah. Or you can hear. So you can hear. What? Welcome back this afternoon. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Mr. Rob Newman here, who uh, was going to tell you all about his experience in developing a joint venture between Atari and Activision, was it, yep. that was doing it? Uh, and it was kind of a... Considering now with the Xbox and the PlayStation, what they're doing with the online, you're way ahead of your time back then. Yeah. And uh, he's going to tell you all about that, and then we'll open it up for questions. And I would just ask that you could try to speak loudly because we're recording this for posterity. And uh, if, if I might repeat the questions if if uh, they can't hear it for okay. you. So posterior, posterity, posterior, posterior, whatever it may be. So it's my privilege to introduce. Let's give my hand. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Um, my name is Rob Newman, and uh, actually, I, I'm going to start actually even before Electronic Publishing Systems, which was the name of the the name of the joint venture uh, in which we did the Electronic Pipeline. I'm actually going to start. It's not working. Oh, it would help if I turn it. Okay. See, I left radio, so I don't pay attention to this stuff. Um, the uh, so I'm going to start. I'm going to start going back before the days of the electronic pipeline, going back to actually my being brought into Atari's Los Angeles lab, which was a, a little-known long-term corporate R&D lab. And that, that one's a whole story unto itself. Uh, I was, I was very hopeful that this year, I, I've been up here to talk about, about these things for the past couple of years, but I was very hopeful that this year I was going, going to be able to bring two of my colleagues from LA Lab and, and um, EPS, the Atari Activision Joint Venture. EPS was Electronic Publishing Systems, which, which was the actual name of the company. Uh, unfortunately, schedules didn't work out for uh, for the other two this time. Uh, I'm hopeful that maybe next year we can get uh, we can get the former director of Atari's Los Angeles lab, and uh, and then the senior real-time programmer uh, for LA Lab uh, here because they have much better stories than I do. I mean, some of the stories they have having to do with Atari and and LA Lab. Um, as I'm sure you read in the uh, uh, in the the um, program, LA Lab was in the middle of the Warner Brothers Studios Ranch in in Burbank, and so literally outside the office was the plane from Fantasy Island. I mean, for real, the plane from Fantasy Island, which, by the way, was made of plywood. Uh, I mean, you could literally walk up through the tail and you know walk out just like they did on the TV show. Um, and you know you had to look at it from the right angle, you know, and then you know you, they had the trees and everything, and you could tell that it wasn't a parking lot behind it. Uh, and the water in front of it, and there were no wings or anything. I mean, it was just kind of the plywood back of a fuselage. And um, and and in front of it, they had these trays of water, and the water was only about that deep. <laughs> So they would just shine the, you know, shine lights on these trays of water, uh, you know, to show the uh, to show the water uh, the water reflection. It, it was really pretty funny, and and um, you know, whenever they were filming with all of the women with their uh, with their tops literally glued on, um, you know, you you always had a good number of us uh, out there in front watching. Uh, but also uh, also there on the lot, uh, you know, we we had the Partridge Family House, the Bewitched House, and uh, you know, I watched them watched them film Gremlins. Um, you know, so they actually the snow for that was uh, sand, uh, and then they took tree flocking and flocked the cars and you know all the other things to to make it look like snow. And they're filming it in August. It's a hundred degrees outside, and they're filming snow. So uh, yes, Hollywood works. Uh, LA Lab was was really an interesting place. Um, LA Lab did not start out under Atari. It actually started out under under Warner Communications. Uh, which Atari was owned by. Atari was owned by Warner Communications, was now AOL Time Warner. And, uh, and this was a group that was pulled together to actually do the development of the interactive television for the Cube cable TV system, which was the first interactive cable television system back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, they did the business programming there, they did the real-time programming there, and then they came to the end of that project, and uh, they were 
trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do? This thing's either going to disband, you know, Warner's going to say we're done, or, uh, you know, we need to come up with some other things. Well, by that time, they'd already started doing some projects for Atari, uh, including, uh, including some video disc kiosk development. Again, remember, this is the early 80s. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were doing, let's see, what were some of the other things they were doing? They, they were actually doing the rankings for the Association of Tennis Professionals on an Atari 800. Now, remember, these Atari 800s had 10 megabyte Corvus mirror hard drives hooked up to them through the game ports. We had, uh, we had also uh, started developing things like uh, local area networks of Atari 800s with the first one actually actually put in for uh, Club Med in Punta Cana. Um, and I had, I had come into uh, LA Lab too late to go on that trip, but half the office went to Club Med to go install this local area network. They're there for a week for maybe three or four hours worth of work. Okay, life's rough. And so the, uh, and so the chant was, boondoggle, ho! I mean, it was really funny. They, they had a blast. We had breakout tournaments. We had all kinds of things. And, uh, but while it sounds like a lot of it was fun and games, there was also a lot of, a lot of hard work going on. We really, really did some pretty, pretty neat stuff. Uh, I had come into LA Lab from Malibu Grand Prix, which was a sister company to Atari, also owned by Warner Communications, where I was doing all of Malibu's electronic design at the time. Uh, designing batting cage electronics, uh, and actually where I had gotten the visibility with these with these guys from um, from LA Lab, and also with the guys from uh, Grass Valley Cyan Engineering, which is another corporate R&D group uh, for Atari. Uh, we were developing a networked. Let's see, what's what's the best way to describe this? It was there were boxes that we would put in the coin op video games that would count the tokens or the quarters. So you did not have to go to each video game with a coin counter and empty it out. You would just basically go to your little computer back in the back, and this again was done on an, on an Atari 800. You just go to your computer in the back and it would tell you exactly how many tokens are in each machine. It would tell you if they've been tampered with. It would tell you if the front door had been opened. Um, and, and the goal was to actually sell these units uh, as you know, as networks for family entertainment centers, arcades, uh, and uh, you know, in order to help them help them manage these things better. Well, Atari decided that uh, you know, a company doing you know five seven million dollars a year in sales just wasn't going to be big enough, so they ended up dropping the project. Um, I was the contact with Malibu Grand Prix where it, where the testing was being done and where we were doing some of the uh, some of the work and trying to figure out okay how do we do this without having to string extra wires and we were we were exploring doing it through what's called carrier current basically putting um, you know putting RF or radio frequency down the uh, uh, down the power lines and uh, and trying to work it out that way uh, so ultimately from that I was brought into brought into LA Lab when uh, in fact when when Steve Davis the director of LA Lab found out that I was uh, I'd bump, had been bumping my head at LA, or at, uh, at Malibu Grand Prix uh, and I was looking to go somewhere where I could be challenged a bit more and get recognized for some of the work I was doing uh, he invited me out to LA Lab uh, that day took me around had me interview with a couple of people and I had no idea they were interviews I mean I'd been to LA Lab before um, on this other project, and I figured, oh, you know, hey, you know, it's just kind of nice, you know, taking me around, and then, you know, brings me in to, you know, see these three people, and then all of a sudden takes me out to the front railing. We're out looking at, you know, the, the you know, TV sets and, and facades and whatnot, and he just turns to me and says, okay, so what's it going to take to get you here? I'm like, oh, okay, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Half hour, hour later, um, you know, we're sitting there. Well, I've got a, you know, at that point, I've then got a title of associate engineer. We figured out how much I'm going to make. We figured out how he's going to argue for the salary, and uh, and he said, you know, says, okay, well, let me get this, uh, you know, get this faxed or overnighted, you know, up to uh, up to Sunnyvale, and uh, you know, you'll be hearing from the guys up there in uh, in HR. And next thing I know, I get a phone call over at Malibu Grand Prix from one of the guys in HR saying, well, I'm FedExing your uh, your offer letter out today. 
Now remember, it was pretty unusual for an individual to get a FedEx at that point. So they FedEx it to me at Malibu Grand Prix. So as soon as I got that, okay, I write up a real quick, uh, uh, a real quick resignation letter. The electronics group was actually in the back of the corporate office, behind the warehouse. Okay, we had the corporate office up front, then we had the warehouse area and production area, and electronics was actually next to the back door. And uh, which allowed us, hey, we didn't have to you know, worry about anybody looking in on it, it was great. And, um, uh, and so, okay, I give, you know, give my resignation to the director of, of electronics division. And, uh, and so he starts walking up front. I take, you know, I start walking up front, maybe 30 seconds behind him, maybe a minute behind him. I make it to the restroom, which is right next to the door to the corporate area, corporate office area, and I've already got people coming into the warehouse through the back door saying, oh, I hear you're going to Atari. For my last day at, at Malibu, I had uh, my boss, director of, of the electronics division, he was off at one of the locations, one of the Malibu locations back east, and so I was actually running the electronics group for the, for the last week. And uh, which actually sounds like a bigger deal. There was only like three or four of us in there. And, um, and so uh, for my last day, I have uh, Bob Trevathan, who's the CFO of Malibu Grand Prix, and whoever the director of operations was at the time. I don't remember his name offhand. And apparently, they had been trying to get transferred into Atari for some time. <laughs> And so they take me out to El Torito. Now realize, I don't drink a whole lot, even when I drink. Um, you know, and so they're taking me to El Torito, trying to get me blasted, to find out how it was I managed to get into Atari and they didn't. It was really pretty funny. This was 1983. Now little do they know, Atari's gonna crash the next year. Although Malibu went not long after. Uh, the, uh, so anyway, so they end up in, in LA Lab where, you know, I was charged with, uh, with setting up a, a new electronics uh, hardware shop in this group of what is essentially programmers. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, when, when stuff needed to be done, when somebody needed to, you know, throw solder around, uh, I was the one who was going to be doing it. I also set up purchasing system and things like that. I had a lot of fun. I mean, it, it was really a lot of fun over there at, at LA Lab, and you know, we got to joke around a lot. But also, we got, you know, we got the opportunity to work on some leading edge stuff. I mean, here we were, <laughs> here we were in the middle of the of the ranch, uh, the the studio, and now realize we're not even in a regular building. It's a set of trailers on jacks, all put together. And we have, you know, one two thirds of it, and then the other two thirds is a ser is a set of Warner Brothers auditors. So we have, you know, we have this series of temporary buildings that are all put together with a computer room in the middle. If you can imagine a Vax 11780, a quarter million dollar computer that's like three or four refrigerators, sitting in a building on jacks. Okay. And then at the other end of the computer room, we had a Data General MB8000, which was the type of computer they were using for the cube cable TV system, which is another three computers and you know six figures. I don't even remember what. You know, and it, I mean, it was just a riot. So, uh, so actually, Ray Corns, one of the guys there, coined the uh, coined the name Fantasy Trailer. So, uh, so that was what what we called it was Fantasy Trailer. Fast forward a little bit. Uh, one of the projects that we start working on there is a project under the name Electronic Distribution, or Project Ed. And uh, oh, by the way, a, a, another little aside: the, the local area network that we developed. I just found that I just was reminded of this. I, I had just gotten back together with with uh, the former director of LA Lab and the former, uh, or also one of my colleague, another one of my colleagues from LA Lab, uh, who was essentially the CTO for Electronic Publishing Systems. And uh, and was just reminded that the name of the local area network project was the Allen K. Now, for those of you who don't know, Allen K was the chief scientist of, at Atari at the time, 
who then went on to be an Apple Fellow, and now he's working on a on a project called Squeakland. Um, so, uh, but you know, he he was a big deal. In fact, the the running joke was uh, Alan Kay just had to float through your company for it to be successful. Um, in any case, start working on Project Ed. And uh, this project was to do distribution of video games to the home without doing new cartridges. It didn't start out as being wireless distribution. It actually started out as being over the vertical blanking interval on, well, we were trying to do it on MTV, which at the time was co-owned by Warner. Uh, but MTV wouldn't return our calls. Uh, so we ended up starting to talk to ESPN and, and a couple of other cable channels. But along the way, um, and the, the vertical blanking interval stuff was being developed by Steve Mayer's lab back in New York. Um, so along the way, there were some tests done. Uh, and there's a whole story around, <laughs> around how those tests got done. Not everything happens quite, quite as straight, in as straightforward a manner as you would think it would happen in a large company. Um, but if, uh, you know, if my colleague Ray were, Ray were here, he'd have the whole story with, with all of this, which you'd just kind of shake your head going, I don't believe this stuff really goes on. Um, really a lot of fun, uh, crazy stuff. But sometimes in order, to, in order to make sure you're doing the right thing, sometimes you just have to kind of go under the radar to, to do some of these tests and get it done. Well, they did that with this vertical blanking interval stuff and found that uh, I think they estimated that there was a 98% chance that it wouldn't work. <laughs> And that was after doing actual testing on a cable system in Boston. And, uh, and so, and this, this is how Ray recalls the story, and I vaguely remember it now. I don't remember a lot. Not all the brain cells are still there anymore. This, this stuff is almost 20 years ago now. And apparently, Ray had just gotten off the phone with the guy who did the tests back. Uh, the guy who did the tests is actually in New York, but he, you know, he ended up doing the tests in Boston. Had gotten off the phone with the guy who did the tests, who said 98% chance it won't work. And so, you know, Ray's got a really bad headache. He's stressed out. He's not quite sure how this is all going to work out. Uh, we were already involved in trying to develop the cartridge and, and develop some of the technologies behind it. Uh, and here we were, this thing may not go. And, uh, and so between Ray's door and Steve's door, Steve was director of LA Lab, was about 10 feet. There was one office between them. In the time that Ray walked out of his door and was on his way to Steve's door, apparently I came whipping around the corner saying, there's this technology that, you know, that we may be able to do this with. I had no idea that, that he had just gotten the phone call that, you know, that this thing wasn't going to work. I had no clue. And you know, in that time, I was, what, 22 years old, running through the landscape a million miles an hour, uh, you know, not knowing half the stuff that's going on around me. And, uh, and so, you know, new technology, the FCC just opened up FM broadcast subcarriers, uh, you know, we've got twice the spectrum available to us to do this, da 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 da, you know, and, and he's like, wait a minute, slow down, okay, hold on. Um, you know, explain this to me again. So I explained a little bit of it, and he says, not now, let me get back to you, and walks into Steve's office. He's in Steve's office for about 10 minutes, and, and as Ray tells it, he walks up to Steve and he says, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And, oh, Mike, the guy who, who told Steve, actually the way he told it was, I've got good news and I've got bad news. You know, Ray says, what's the good news? And uh, and Steve says, I got sleep last night. And uh, then Ray says, okay, what's the bad news? 98% 98 chance it won't work. Okay, so Ray decides to do the same thing with Steve. We got good news and I got bad news. Steve does the opposite. What's the bad news? Okay, well, I just got a call from, uh, from Mike back in New York. 98% chance it won't work. Steve's all great. Okay, what's the good news? Well, apparently there's this new technology, FM subcarriers, that we might be able to do it with. And Steve said, well, tell me more. 
And Ray says, I don't know. <laughs> and so they call me into the office. I'm there for like five minutes. And Steve actually has experience in RF. So I can go blasting through all of the information and you know, laying out how, you know, uh, you know, how the subcarrier gets used and some of the legalities of it, because I came from broadcast. And, uh, you know, and then they excuse me. And uh, it's like, okay, that's the direction we're going. <laughs> okay. So ultimately then at that point, Steve breaks off to go form his own consulting firm where they did the, uh, where they did the hardware development for the cartridge uh, and, the, uh, and the transmission stuff. And Ray and I became co-founders of what became the Atari Activision Joint Venture, Electronic Publishing Systems. It was, uh, it was to do wireless distribution of video games to the Atari 2600. Um, and this is, actually, this is one of the actual test cartridges, by the way. This is, uh, this is an actual cartridge that we did with Alpha. Uh, I was Alpha testing with this cartridge in LA, San Francisco, and San Jose. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, we, I mean, some of the stuff that, that we, you know, that we managed to pull off with this stuff, um, pretty incredible. We did a, uh, this is, I mean, this has the radio receiver in it. Each cartridge had one of four billion addresses. The uh, data rate over the subcarrier was uh, 33.68 kilobits per second in 1983. Now to give you an idea, um, you know, give, give you a sense of, of scale on that, the typical modem at the time was a 300 baud modem. If you had a lot of money, it was 1200 baud. Uh, in broadcast, the fastest data rate they were using in FM subcarriers was about 4800 on any consistent basis. So we were operating about eight times that, seven or eight times that. The, uh, the subcarrier was uh, just this mound of, I mean, if you looked at it on a spectrum analyzer, it was just this mound of, of stuff <laughs> from 55 to 98 kilohertz in the FM broadcast baseband. Um, and uh, where up to that point, um, if you're into the, into the technical stuff, uh, they were using uh, what's called uh, FSK, or frequency shift keying, for the data. We were using vestigial sideband suppressed carrier with uh, quadrature sync uh, at the, at the 33.68 uh, kilobit rate. The data rate after error correction and overhead was still about 29K. The, uh, and, and we were able to get this through the FM broadcast uh, transmitters without, without any problem, actually, you know, with very, very little problem. Uh, and, uh, and actually, we're testing in uh, San Jose on KOME, in San Francisco on KBL, and in Los Angeles on KCRW. And, um, uh, you know, some pretty interesting stuff. Now, the subcarrier generator was a plug-in card in an IBM PC an IBM PC XT with a 10 megabyte hard drive and a green screen. Now, you may think, okay, so what? This was 1983. This was two years after the PC had been released. Plug-in cards in a PC were unheard of at that point. The subcarrier was completely digitally generated uh, with, uh, with a simulated tap delay line filter uh, the only analog on that card was a uh, was a low pass filter out the back end. That's it. Um, I mean, these uh, Steve and and the people that he was working with on on this were just unbelievable. And then uh, and then inside the inside the cartridge here, I mean, we've got a custom gate array uh, that uh, that they had uh, that they had actually uh, worked with. Uh, I think VLSI on. Um, got an EEPROM here. And, uh, and so you plug in the cartridge into a 2600, it goes out, it automatically finds the proper, uh, the proper radio signal. Um, you, uh, you know, it locks on, it validates the cartridge. It, uh, it then downloads a menu of, uh, of games up to, I think, uh, typically we were doing about 40. You'd select your game with the joystick, hit the fire button, and it downloads the game. 
And it was all doing it over a data endless loop. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, last year we, uh, we screened a, a commercial of this, and the, the screens that you saw were, were actually from the system, from the cartridge, and actually I was the one playing it you know, while, we were, while we were recording it on a video recorder. Um, it, was, it, it was some pretty cool stuff. Um, ultimately, uh, we, you know, we were working on getting, uh, getting bugs out, uh, testing, trying to figure out, okay, what problems are we going to have with, uh, with multipath, uh, which is uh, basically, uh, you've all seen ghosts uh, on over-the-air television. Uh, well, that's multipath, where you have, you have your main signal um, coming to your antenna, the stronger of the signals, and then you have another one that's bouncing off of something. It could be a building, a mountain, whatever it may be, that slightly delays the amount of time, and that's what causes the ghost. Well, since we're operating at a, at a relatively high data rate uh, with, uh, with this, multipath can be a pretty serious problem. And, and so we were trying to figure out, OK, how bad a problem is it? Uh, so, uh, so we were in the process of doing that testing, and I was I was just four days to before uh, installing the transmission equipment in the first test market, which was going to be Utica, New York, uh, when the project was postponed indefinitely due to Warner Brother or Warner Communications selling Atari to Jack Tramiel. Um At that time, we didn't know who owned two thirds of of our joint venture. Uh, and which was really interesting. I mean, we had, it was pretty crazy because here we were, we had our own funding. Um, we'd received, we had about $3 million in the bank, um, large, some of it from, uh, from Atari, a little bit of it from Activision, and primarily actually from uh, Hillman Venture Capital, who was the, at the time the um, venture capital was throwing around the most money uh, up there in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, so you know our funding wasn't really in jeopardy because we already had the cash. But you know, what was going to happen? We had no idea. And you know, and then we have you know, apparently Tremel thought he bought, uh, you know, he bought Warner's interest in the in the venture, and uh, that was in actually turned out in a direct violation of the uh, of the joint venture agreement, uh, which meant that not only did Tremel not get the uh, uh, not get their interest in the venture, thank God. Um, but uh, but Warner kept it and lost their board seats on top of that. Um, it, it was a real interesting time. Um, the we also had uh, had the thing gone forward. We also had already received a seven million dollar second round commitment, or, or actually an add-on commitment to do a national rollout. Uh, so, I mean, here we were in 1983-94, and we were essentially a $10 million startup, which is mind-boggling. Even from, you know, when you tra when you extrapolate out to dot-com times, that's even mind-boggling, um, because at the time, you know, typical startups were getting what a million, maybe, uh, and uh, it, it was really pretty incredible. Uh, you know, I look back on that whole time as uh, as a lot of uh, education, <laughs> beating my head against the wall. Um, learned a lot, did a lot, and it, it was really a, a a pretty incredible time between the LA Lab stuff and and um, uh, and the joint venture. Uh, in fact, uh, Ray, the CTO of uh, of EPS. Uh, also a colleague at LA Lab. He and I actually maintained offices not only up in Silicon Valley. The office for the joint venture was 1171 Borregas, uh, right at the corner of uh, Moffett Park and, uh, and Borregas, right there in, on the Atari campus. We were just a few doors down from corporate research and, and uh, corporate. And um, uh, in fact, I, I think we, if I remember right, we shared the building with Minitel. Every, anybody remember the uh, the Minitel project? That was another one that was that Atari was working on, which was, uh, in some sense, uh, similar to uh, what the internet has done now, and that's bringing email to the home, email and coupons and things like that to the home through just a very small uh, interface that you just plug into your phone line. 
And that was what they were working on over on that side. So they called it Tari Tail? Is, what, is that what? You know what? I don't remember. A... Maybe it was maybe it was called Minitel in France, because um, that was actually based on something that was being done in France. So again, that was many years ago. I seem to recall right before the crash, they had an Atari Tell logo revealed, and there's going to be some special project that they're working on. Could have been, and of course, disappeared. Never saw the light of day. Yeah, it, it could have been. It could have been that project. We shared the building with them. Uh, in fact, there wasn't even a wall between the two sides of the office. Um, I mean, you could actually walk from one side to the other. Um, so, uh, so for me, I mean, my exposure to Atari was really more around the periphery. I wasn't necessarily in, in the core stuff, dealing with uh, dealing with you know development of games and things like that. I mean, for me, it was more a matter of doing you know this this wireless distribution of video games, uh, working on the local local area networking of the 2600, and and you know playing the corporate research games, uh, and uh, it was really pretty cool. Um, I mean, that's. I, I don't know how much more I can really uh, contribute over and above that. I did. Uh, I did manage to go through uh, when my former boss was over to the house. We did go through my old file. I've got a file about that thick of, uh, of paperwork, uh, and I did find the original pencil schematic of this cartridge uh, in my files, as well as uh, uh, I still have some of the. Um, uh, some of the marketing materials that were developed. I also have a copy of the uh, of the TV commercial. Um, don't know how many of those were around. We did play that last year uh, here at uh, at Classic Gaming Expo. And um, uh, what else did we find? I found uh, a, a picture of the original block diagram uh, that the CTO had developed, actually showing in in a kind of a block diagram flowchart type manner how the business was going to work including uh, including the uh, basically showing from the customer going all the way through taking the order uh, and this was going to be a subscription service it was going to be I think 29.95 a month or no 29.95 for the cartridge and 9.95 a month for the service and um, uh, you know in the the uh, bank lock boxes and the uh, computer, uh, you know, the the central computer office that would end up calling up uh, each of the PCs up on the mountaintops at the at the radio transmitter mountaintops, uh, and download the new game information and uh, and the new uh, the new game uh, authorization uh, for anyone who had just started or stopped <laughs> their subscription, uh, and then would tell it to reconfigure. And you know, and hang up. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, it was the first offline or the first um, uh, FM broadcast subcarrier system that did not require uh, did not require a, a you know phone line all the time or a data link all the time uh, in real time to the hill. Um, and uh, and so it was. Some of the things that we were doing, I mean, we're we're really pretty far out there uh, for the time. I was gonna. Uh, we have about probably ten minutes for questions, so I had a quick one for that. Sure. Uh, now, now that did not hook up to the phone line um, from the the customer that bought it. No. So how? I, I'm just trying to understand the business model of how would you prevent them from receiving the FM signal if it's being transmitted. Uh, well, you how, don't how exactly that. You don't prevent them from receiving the signal. What you do is you uh, you have e each cartridge is individually addressable. And so, uh, and so, each cartridge uh, actually right, right here was where a barcode was. So before we shipped out the cartridge, there was a barcode sticker that was put on here that was matched up with the uh, uh, matched up with the chips inside the cartridge. So that uh, so that then okay, we would tell the uh, we would tell the computer in Utica or Terre Haute or wherever it may be to um, uh, to go ahead and authorize that cartridge. And uh, and it would authorize the cartridge as part of the startup process when you first turned on the uh, first turned on the unit uh, when you you know when you plug it into the to the 2600 and you turn it on and it goes out and it finds the radio station each time it validates that cartridge if you pull the power off it's in RAM so it goes away. Gotcha. And so, and if they didn't pay their subscription fee or they chose to discontinue it, then it suddenly right. Then we would just receive. remove that authorization from over the air. Gotcha. Some questions. Yes. Yes. Um, well, it's kind of the same question in two parts. But how successful do you think that 
the venture was, um, what would have made it successful? And, yeah, I guess that's it. Do you want me to repeat that? So they, sure, go ahead. <laughs> the question was, what, what would have made that joint venture more successful? Um, I suppose, had Warner not folded, maybe where, where it would have gone? or We were basically ready to go with the market test. Um, we had, um, you know, we had the, uh, the, the company that was going to take all of the inbound 800 telephone calls already handled. We already had the banking relationships. We already had, you know, the, the technology was essentially developed. Yeah, we were we had some bugs that we still needed to work out and figure out, but but we were you know we were basically ready to uh, ready to go out and, and hit the test market. The the plug was pulled before we actually went out and did the test market. So we never had the opportunity to uh, to really see what the consumers thought. Um, both uh, both my my former boss and I, the, the CTO and I, uh, still are you know feel pretty adamant about we should have had that chance. Um, we we really it would not have cost really any more money than was already invested in order to test it and try it out. And uh, but the problem the problem that was underlying all of this is that you need to remember that when when we established this venture. And when Warner, when Warner sold Atari, the video game industry was essentially deemed dead. It was done. And uh, now we know we know now that that's not the case. Um, you know, it took another couple of years for this company called Nintendo to come around and prove that wrong. But the but the popular wisdom on Wall Street and and uh, even with the the retailers. Uh, was that the video game? You know, video games are dead, and then uh, you know, and then ultimately, uh, you know, if everybody's saying video games are dead, well, why move forward? And so, uh, after uh, after they pulled that, we uh, we kind of floundered for a little while. Uh, I left, Ray left, uh, and uh, and they decided to try and recast it more for uh, for personal computers, but it never ultimately got anywhere. And there's only so far you can go with with this technology, or, or only so much you can do with it, because ultimately it was based upon an endless loop of data. There's only so much data you can put in an endless loop without making the wait too long. And the goal was to keep that wait under 60 seconds. So, uh, and that included all of the validations, you know, all of the cartridge validations, which are going all the time, and the games, and all of the rest of it. So, uh, so there was going to be a point at which you couldn't, you know, the the, the data was either going to get too big, or what it was you were trying to get across was going to have to change possibly in real time, and you know that requires a little bit different approach to the business. Any more questions? Um, over here first, in the orange. Yeah, uh, for 20 years ago, that's a really advanced technology. Even today, it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Has anybody ever taken it and done anything with it? Was it kind of sort of using or did it see any light of day at all? I don't know. Um, and to be honest, I don't know what patents were actually filed on it. Um, Steve would actually be able to tell you uh, tell you that because he was the one who was a lot closer to where the you know where that where that particular development was coming from. What I was really more uh, more involved in was the relations with the radio stations and you know dealing with the whole transmission process. Um, although you know I also had my fingers in the electronics side of it, my primary focus was in how do we get the data to the mountaintop and how do we you know get this into the transmitter and how do we make sure that it's going to continue to work uh, and you know and, and you know I was the one who had to maintain the credibility with the broadcast chief engineers and you know talk them through the whole thing because you know what you know, you come walking in saying, "Yeah, I'm going to do this." Uh, you know, this FM subcarrier, and by the way, we're going to need uh, whatever it was. You know, 18% injection. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, you know, and and oh, by the way, no, it's not going to make your uh, you know make your main channel noisy and and all of that stuff. So I was, you know, I was the guy who was like them, who used to be a broadcast chief engineer, who could talk that language, and and that was my primary role at that time. A couple more questions. Yes, over here. Do you have any uh, custom programming, any special games to help this service? Or 
we're, we're, the the games that we had um, part of the intent with this was to uh, was to essentially pull some of the games um, that may have been developed um, but not marketed out of the archives and uh, remember this was a joint venture of Atari and Activision um, you know they you know they were the ones that had that had so much of the uh, so much of that content to put on it and. Um, and in fact, you know, you've got two companies that are used to suing each other's brains out, actually getting together in this joint venture, which was which was pretty amazing. Although Activision really didn't have a lot to do with, you know, with us on a day-to-day -day basis. There was kind of there was an MBA type that they sent over who none of us got along with. <laughs> um, and and actually, what's interesting is, uh, you know, I've actually had the opportunity here at, at Classic Gaming Expo, um, actually last year, to talk with Dave Crane and and Al Miller. Uh, about about the project, they don't remember investing in it. <laughs> and uh, but what was all, what was also cool, and you know, and I I had brought the brought the cartridge to dinner and and wanted to uh, you know introduce myself and say hello and and talk to them a little bit about it, and they're saying you know we don't remember this. And, uh, and but at the same time, you know, they also say you know what we were investing in like 15 different projects at the time. We don't remember them all anyway. And uh, and then what was really cool was was Dave Crane then sat down with the cartridge and started pointing at the different parts of the cartridge. Now keep in mind that he hadn't seen this before, or at least hadn't seen it for almost 20 years, if if at all. And um, you know, and and he still remembered what the parts were, you know, the memory chips and and all of that stuff. I remember in in a more general sense, you know, the sections of the cartridge and, and some of these things. But I've been away from it long enough. I've now gone on to to the management side, um, you know, having gotten a bachelor's and a master's in, in business. Um, so for me, I mean, I hadn't even thought about this thing, you know, the insides of this thing, uh, or even how it worked for many, many years. And it was only about three years ago, three or four years ago, that, you know, I finally remember the the data is operating at a fast enough rate and the, and you've got another, a whole other sync going on in the quadrature, um, in the quad, quadrature realm that it could determine relatively quickly whether I would whether it was looking at the right signal or the or not so in in a manner similar to like an FM radio that looks at a 19 kilohertz sub uh, subcarrier to see if there's a stereo channel there and it lights up your little light and you know makes it you know one channel into two um, in this case it was looking at the spectrum from 55 to 98 kilohertz and looking to see if you know if it had the characteristics that it needed to see and it could determine that relatively quickly and so it would it would first lock on and say okay I have a carrier here or I have a signal here and okay is it you know is it one I can recognize yes or no no okay boom next one next one next one next one so it, it actually could lock on relatively quickly well thank you Rob we're out of time thank you very much Thank you.